Hey, it is Tiki Technical Tuesday, and in this episode, we are going to be casting production molds for slip casting. Now, we've covered this once before, but that was way back in episode 16, back before we were shooting in luscious widescreen. So I figured since we spent all of last episode making these beautiful silicone molds, perhaps I should show you what I do with them. For today's plaster adventure, you are going to need a respirator to keep you safe, a cordless drill with a handy dandy mixing attachment, a five gallon bucket of water, a digital scale, and some number one USG pottery plaster. I keep my pottery plaster stored in these five gallon buckets with airtight lids. This keeps moisture out of my plaster and it gives me a little working table when I stack the buckets on top of each other. Yes, I am wearing Crocs today, and yes, my socks don't match. I feel we've spent enough time together that you'll understand that studios are spaces where you wear practical things, not fashionable things. So I hope you understand. I've got a spritzer of watered down Windex and a spritzer of alcohol. So these things are all about fighting bubbles. Silicone is hydrophobic, meaning it doesn't like water. And water will tend to bead up on there, which means you will trap air bubbles when you pour plaster into it. So I spray the Windex solution in here to break the surface tension of the plaster as it flows into the mold and it keeps it from catching bubbles for the most part. And then I use the alcohol spritz on the surface of the plaster after I pour it to break the surface tension there and get rid of any surface bubbles. I have tried a bunch of different stuff besides using this Windex. I used alcohol. I tried using that stuff that you put in your dishwasher, um, you know, to, to help break the surface tension of the water. This works best for me. I, it may not work best for you. Try, experiment. If you find something great, let me know. Um, but this is what I do. Okay, folks, it's plaster time. We start with two quarts of ice cold water, and then we carefully sift in our precisely weighed plaster, and we let it slake. We let it soak up that ice water goodness before we mix. And I'm going to say I never really was meticulous about measuring and weighing and all that stuff, but I sure am now. Uh, and you can see as I mix, I'm going to be constantly looking at my watch to make sure that I am hitting all the times on the nose. Now, what times do I follow? Well, I'll link to a couple books in the description of this video so you can read up on plaster to your heart's content. After mixing, the tools get a quick rinse in the bucket, and that's what the bucket is for. You do not want plaster going down the sink. Oh, there's the Windex, the Windex, the surface tension breaker, and then we slow, well, I guess I'm gonna knock some air bubbles out. Quick spritz of alcohol to break all the surface bubbles off, and then we're going. Now, look, I put this stuff in very slowly, and I want the actual surface tension of the plaster to pull it across the mold surface. I don't want to whoosh, pour it in and encapsulate any bubbles. I want this to go slowly. You're watching this at like two times speed and still it's it's slow. This is my magical bubble breaking technique. Once I've got that surface debubbled and poured, I can speed up the pour and um, yeah, I'm not too stressed about bubbles. Final, final knocks. And then we're gonna do a quick alcohol spritz. Bam! Now this leftover plaster will go straight to the bag that it came in originally. Those bags are watertight and they're great for dumping any unneeded plaster in. Do not dump this down your sink and then clean the buckets in that bucket of water. Do not clean these in your sink. All right, the plaster is poured and the molds are setting. In about an hour, we'll be able to open these up and go through it all again. Now, you may be wondering, why are we even doing all this? Didn't we spend the entire last episode making a perfectly beautiful plaster mold? We did, but the answer to why we're doing this involves a little bit of mold math. So with one mold in one day, you can get one casting. That's just the way we work in the studio. It gives time for the mold to refresh. That means in a week, five work days, Monday through Friday, you'll end up with five mugs. This sounds like a lot, but if you're shooting for an addition of 200, that's 40 weeks. And that's almost a year. And keep in mind, even if you're willing to wait a year through this casting, if at any time your mold should break, you are out of luck. There is no way to repair it, and casting has to stop. 
Now, if we have 10 molds in one day, we can cast 10 mugs. That means in any given week, we can cast 50 mugs. That's a ton of mugs. It will only take us four weeks to reach our addition of 200. Okay, but now you may be wondering, that's fine, but what if we don't mind spending a month or two just casting one a day if we're very careful and we don't drop the mold? Can't we still get by with that one original plaster mold? Well, there's another layer of mold math and that involves the longevity of a plaster mold. During the casting process, two things are happening to the mold. One, the porous plaster is slowly getting clogged up with little itty bitty particles of slip. And two, the slip itself is actually breaking down the plaster of your mold, causing pinholes and pits and just wearing away the detail in general. Now your mileage is gonna vary depending on the type of deflocculant and slip that you're using. But for me, with the level of detail I want, I can get about 15 to 20 castings out of a mold before I have to retire it. All right, it's been an hour and it's time to open these things up. Now, um, plaster is, wait for it, exothermic, which means it gives off heat while it cures. Um, so I let these things get really hot and then I wait for them to cool a bit before I open them up. Now, um, some people say as soon as the plaster hits its peak temperature, that means it's safe to demold. I just kind of wait an hour usually. I go do something else, come back, pop them open. Now, some of these molds are very easy to open. And some of them aren't. For the more tricky ones to open up, um, this is where I am glad we used the Craig jig. You can back the pocket screws out and it makes it easier to get the silicone out of the jacket uh, because once the plaster's in there, it becomes very rigid. This one is, of all of the pieces, the most stubborn when it comes to getting this out of this. As we get pieces out of the mold, um, we can't just stick them all together and call it done. The edge, the top edge that faces up in the mold, it is icky, it doesn't have a nice edge on it, whereas all of these other edges look great. So I go to the plaster bucket and I use a sure form and I just get those edges looking good. I'll do a final cleanup with this drywall sandpaper stuff. It's great. Uh, and I'll go over the, the top edge because there's little, it's just a little rough. I'd like to get it perfect. Uh, why do I put an angle on these edges instead of leaving them with that really rough angle? Well, these are less likely to chip while I'm handling the mold and I don't want any plaster chips finding their way into my slip tank. So much better. So that's basically how it works. I do this entire five piece mold in three two quart batches of plaster. Uh, after each one cures, I take it out of the mold, I clean the mold out, reset it for the next casting, and then I go and just clean those freshly cast plaster bits out in the plaster cleaning bucket. Am I crazy for sanding molds? Here's the deal. We're gonna be spending a lot of time with these molds casting a lot of pieces, and I want those pieces to be as good as possible. So all the time they put into the production molds will pay off when we actually have to use them for casting. So no, it's not crazy to sand them. Based on the mold math that we went over earlier, I'm gonna be casting a total of 10 production molds. Uh, the planned addition size is between 200 and 250. If I go up to 250, I'll cast an additional five molds once those 200 are done.
As soon as I have a complete mold cast, I carefully piece together all the fresh, shiny, and new pieces and strap them up tight for drying. The molds can warp if you don't strap them up close during the complete drying process. At least that's what they tell me, and I am too scared to find out if it's true. Let's talk about these mold straps really quick. These are universal mold straps. Uh, they are safer to use than rubber bands for larger molds, uh, but this buckle, when you tighten it, will eat into your plaster mold. So I like to fold up the extra stuff, put it underneath there as a little buffer, and you're good to go. I'm gonna save you the repetitive process of watching me do this again and again and again to make these 10 molds. Uh, let's just say uh, it took a few days and about 180 pounds of plaster. Um, thank God for editing, right? Oh. All right, that is it. That is number 10 of 10 production molds for the Dead Bastard Mug. Whew. That was a bit of a slog. Now that we have all these fancy pants, brand new, pristine, clean molds, you may be wondering what we do with the old molds from a mug that we've finished. In order to answer that question, I wanna talk a little bit about editions. On the bottom of a mug, you will find an edition number. It is two numbers, one over the other. The bottom number signifies the size of the edition, the amount of total mugs that have been cast and released into the world. The top number signifies the number that the mug in your hand is in that entire edition, meaning in this case, this was the 238th mug that I pulled out of the molds and glazed and finished. Now, sometimes we do cast more than the edition number, and that's only to do glaze tests. I will do those before the actual numbered edition, and the bottoms of those I will mark with AP, or artist proof. And as a rule, I never do more than 10 of these, and often I don't even sell those. In fact, of all of the AP editions that I did for this edition, I ended up destroying most of them because I just did not like the glaze. Now. I will hang on to every mold until I have each one of these cast, glazed, and boxed, and shipped. Just in case I break one and I need to replace it to make sure that that edition is intact, that every single number that I've put on the bottom of these mugs actually exists in the world. Oh, the very final batch of boxed and ready volcanic vapor mugs. These are off to the post office right after I shoot this, which means it is time to take care of those molds once and for all. The edition number is basically a contract between me, the creator, and you, the patron, saying that there are only gonna be X number of these things in the world, and that's it, forever. Now, that's fine, and I promise I won't make any more, but as long as these molds are around, there's a chance that somebody could. If I threw them away, maybe someone will find the mold and cast one, or I'm not gonna be around forever. These molds could definitely outlive me. In that case, to be totally safe, They've got to be destroyed. Okay, I normally don't go after molds with an axe like that. I just do it occasionally, because it's fun. As a rule, when I'm done with the plaster molds, I beat them together until they're broken up, and then I throw them away. But this isn't the only kind of mold we've got to take care of. We've also got the silicone master molds, and these things definitely cannot stick around because, well, they will last forever. When I worked as a special effects artist in Hollywood, we were meticulous about destroying molds. People would comb through our trash cans looking for old thrown away molds in the hopes of casting their own cool movie props. I continue to be meticulous about getting rid of molds when I'm done with them. And as you learned in the last episode, this silicone can find another life in a brand new silicone mold. Okay, that is it. Number 10 of 10, the production molds are all cast and ready to go. Well, they're not quite ready to go. They're gonna have to sit here for at least seven days under a fan to completely dry out before I can cast them. In the meantime, I plan on enjoying my time out of the studio, 
designing new stuff. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for tagging along on yet another episode of Tiki Technical Tuesday, and I will catch you next time.